All right. So here's the big idea. In 2004, uh, this idea emerged from a book, The Emerging Democratic Majority, that said the country is getting more diverse. Diverse people vote Democratic. Uh, it's getting less white, rural, uh, and old. Uh, young people also like Democrats more. So the Democrats will experience a wind at their backs by virtue of demographics that will lead to a sustained majority. And this was borne out in part by Obama's resounding victory in 08. Uh, his victory in 2012 didn't completely debunk it. But in many ways, your book is the big fact-based counterpoint saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. It turns out that that is not correct because of the fact that now the single biggest deal in American politics is not whether you're white or non-white, it's whether you have a college degree or not. Is that a, a fair summary? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that like there, in the wake of the Obama victories, uh, there was definitely a thought process on the left that said, look at all the groups that Obama won, winning young voters by two to one, winning, uh, you know, these expanded majorities among African-Americans doing much better among Latinos, that all these groups are just growing, are going to become more influential in the years to come. And so, uh, you know, we don't really need to change our message. We don't need to moderate our message in order to win, um, that we can just wait for the demographic tides to eventually make it so that, uh, you know, we are going to see the end of, you know, white Christian conservative America, I think was one of the titles of books, you know, kind of the titles of books that came out in this era. But that was a dramatic misreading of both what Obama actually did and uh, both demographically and, uh, you know, message wise. So, um, you know, what you actually saw, uh, you know, during the Obama era was he, him appealing effect, very effectively uh, to these, um, you know, working class people, specifically white working class people in deindustrializing parts of the country. So he did extremely well in the upper Midwest and Midwestern states and states like Michigan and that were experiencing, um, you know, were experiencing an economic collapse because the auto industry uh, was collapsing and he very effectively promoted the auto bailout in 2012 and made that a major dividing line in that election. So I think people like to focus on, look at all the things he did with young progressives, right? And, and mobilizing young progressives and he did that, but it was in, within a coalition of voters who were more conservative temperamentally, which was kind of that white working class, Midwestern auto worker, factory worker uh, that voted for Obama and then shift over to voting for Trump. So what happens when, uh, what happens in that, you know, scenario is that the Democrats start blaming, really, start um, start attacking um, those voters who, you know, calling them racist, calling them people who, uh, you know, are racially resentful, but they, in fact, they voted for Obama. So how how can that be true? It was, you know, Trump uniquely spoke to them in the, sa in, in the same way that Obama uniquely spoke to them. And I think, um, you know, it's funny because you mentioned the emerging Democratic majority, and that was really kind of how it was interpreted, right, as this surge of non-white and progressive uh, voices in the electorate. But um, the authors of that book have a new book out, actually, that uh, and they have already said, like, no, this was wasn't going to come true because specifically our book really also said you need to worry about the white working class. You need to maintain hold serve with the white working class Democrats, and they just haven't done so. And in fact, the rhetoric towards those working class voters in the Midwest um, has been anything but welcoming since 2016. In my view, your book, uh, if I were to simplify it, um, here's the message, is that there are a lot of non-college educated, non-white voters that Democrats in the political class assume, of course, they got to vote for us because we're the party of the diverse. And uh, what are they going to do? Vote for the Republicans? The Republicans are racist. Um, but it turns out in real life, uh, a lot of non-white, non-college graduates uh, actually are very into the Republican Party, uh, where Trump is competing at parity among Latino populations in various parts of the country. Um, there's been a drift towards the Republican Party among uh, Asian Americans. You can even see a little bit of it in the black community, albeit from a very, very low base. Uh, and, and that struck me as the the underpinning of this, is that, look, if you just assumed 
every Latino, Asian, uh, black voter is going to vote Democratic and those populations are going to rise, then all set, Democrats. <laughs> and, and what you're saying is, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you look at the data, it turns out that Democrats have increasingly become the party of the college educated and that if you're a non-college educated a Latino, Asian or black voter, you're actually going to be drifting towards the GOP. Hence, the GOP becoming this multiracial coalition party. Uh, is that, uh, did I get that right? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, this book, you know, I think, I wouldn't say this book specifically, I think reality has challenged a lot of those assumptions that um, people made about the electorate. So, you know, specifically, one of the major failings of this uh, demography as destiny theory was that Latinos would behave the same way as Black voters have historically as uh, members of a cohesive identity group that would uh, move Democratic on the issue of immigration because they favored more legal immigration or favored more, uh, you know, a more open immigration policy that included a pathway to citizenship for illegal immigrants. And that was really kind of the major thinking around 2012. It, you know, that has been proven wrong. I think partly because... You sort of misunderstood. It misunderstands the motivation of most Latino voters. Most Latino voters don't see themselves as part of this unified block of people. They certainly don't see themselves as Latinx, but uh, yeah, continue. they don't see themselves as Latinx. <laughs> they don't always necessarily see themselves as as part of this pan Latino community, right? Um, when you actually talk to them, they, you people say, "I'm Mexican," "I'm Venezuelan," but more more often than that. Uh, they just kind of see themselves as regular Americans. I mean, I think in a lot of places they're very, you know, you've got people who are second. Also, many, many of them are, are deeply religious and uh, part of a like a church community. Right. And so I don't think you can mobilize them right on this sort of identity politics. Um, but I think that there's also a risk, right, where Democrats feel right now they have a little bit of initiative on this abortion issue, which I, I think, you know, to some extent, look, uh, you can't argue with the election results in some of these states that have had referenda on the issue. But I, I think they're not necessarily thinking about how they're branding and defining their party, right? Um, you know, that I think from a coalitional standpoint, you've got a lot of people who are in, within the Democratic Party who have more conservative views on social issues than have more conservative views on, let's say, economic issues. And so long term, when the political you know, sugar high of that issue kind of recedes, what are you left with? You're left with a party that is defined more and more by its left of center views on cultural issues than it, you know, has, it had been defined, whereas it had been defined previously by really standing up for the working class who are the majority, vast majority of the country um, based on lines of college educations and on economics too. I would love, love, love for the Democratic Party uh, or any party to start hitting policies and messages that would appeal to the non-white, non-college educated working class of this country. Because if you improve their lives, you're probably doing something great. You're probably doing something that brings down the cost of housing, bring down, brings down the cost of healthcare, brings down the cost of education, uh, makes it more affordable to be, uh, you know, the... Um, mother or father of a child, make you feel better about the future. So that would make me very, very excited. I certainly think that uh, I, I was on CNN a while ago and I said, look, um, you know what people don't like is uh, a political party as the culture police. It's like, hey, you say or do the wrong thing, you use the wrong word, you're not keeping track of <laughs> the, the, the right terminology, yeah. <laughs> and then, then you're, you're somehow in the outs. I mean, that that, that is a very, very... Uh, esoteric message that does not speak to the non-white working class. I, um, so, so that that's something I would love to see parties take wisdom um, from you and your data. Hey, YouTube, thanks for watching. Please do hit like and subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be notified every time a new episode drops. Thank you.